In this episode, we talk all about pain. We talk about how to eliminate your chronic pain in your body, whether it's your low back, your shoulders, your knees, your hips. We get into ankle stuff. Uh, We talk about the upper body. We talk about why pain is the number one thing you should consider with your training, even if you don't think you have any right now. It's something that is very, very important. We also talk about what to do when you have that pain and why fini- how fixing it can help you build muscle and burn body fat. We talk about the different points or the different steps you should take to alleviating your pain, how to identify the root cause, how to prioritize the right movements, how to apply the right amount of frequency, and then we talk about priming. So you're going to love this Mind Pump episode. Also, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Four Sigmatic. Now, Four Sigmatic has the best adaptogenic mushroom supplements you'll find anywhere. Now, what are adaptogens? Adaptogens help your body deal with stress. Why is this important? Well, exercise is a stress. Every time you lift weights, you're stressing the body. If you take an adaptogen, that means that that signal will work more effectively in your body, potentially allowing you to train harder so you can build more muscle or burn more body fat. Now, here's a cool thing. Four Sigmatic has a instant coffee adaptogen uh, mix. It's amazing. You can use it instead of coffee. It's full of adaptogens. You can even use it to make uh, Dalgona coffee. This is this huge thing that's real popular right now. It's like this delicious whipped coffee dessert. Believe it or not, the adaptogenic coffee from Four Sigmatic works perfectly, and it tastes amazing. Anyway, look, if you want to get the discount uh, from Four Sigmatic that only Mind Pump can give you, this is what you got to do. Go to foursigmatic.com forward slash Mind Pump. So that's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com forward slash Mind Pump and use the code Mind Pump at checkout for 15% off all of their products. Also, all month long, Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro are both 50% off. Now, Maps Prime takes you through a self-assessment process, helps you identify movement issues, and helps you design your priming session. What's a priming session? Well, it's superior to a warm-up. A priming session prepares your body to move more effectively, connect to your muscles better, and fire more muscle fibers. If you prime properly for 5 to 10 minutes or 15 minutes before your workout, you'll get better squats, better deadlifts, better bench presses. You'll just get better results overall. Now, MAPS Prime Pro is about correctional exercise. If you have parts of your body that aren't moving well or areas of your body that are preventing you from making great gains, let's say your hips are stopping you from doing full squats or your knees are preventing you from doing good lunges or your bench press is stuck because your shoulders tend to hurt, You want MAPS Prime Pro. It addresses all the major joints of the body, teaches you correctional exercises for each one. You follow the program, follow the movements, improve your mobility, and move better and reduce your pain. Here's how you get 50% off both programs. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code PRIME50. That's P-R-I-M-E-5-0, no space for the discount. Oh, and by the way, both programs require zero equipment. You can do them anywhere, including your home. Hey, you know, um, I get DMs from trainers and, uh, well, people all the time, but one of the number one things, the questions that I get asked- Loads of DMs. Has to do- <laughs> Thanks. Has to do with, um, revolves around pain. Uh, lots and lots and lots of questions around pain. Well, maybe because that's- Yeah. A, I mean, let's be honest. When you were a personal trainer, uh, I would say 80% of my clients, you know- Battle to chronic pain for sure. It's it's actually maybe, maybe yeah. more. It's oh, actually the majority show, for sure. To, and it's how you showed your value as a trainer. That's oh, yeah. like if you got a client fit, you know, strong fat loss. It's very valuable. You got your client to just move and feel better. Life, they're with you for life. It's mm-hmm. like the most valuable thing that you could possibly do um, as a trainer. And hands down, more valuable than just losing fat and uh, you know body mass and everything else. Like I, honestly, if you can alleviate somebody's pain. Uh, you know, you have a, a lifer client. The, the, it's the number one thing you should actually consider with your training, even if you are pain free. And, and the reason why you should consider it is because nothing will stop your progress in its tracks. Nothing will has the potential to reverse your progress. 
and send you backwards mm-hmm. like pain. Nothing. And you know, if you've been working out for longer than a year, you, you probably know what I'm talking about. I mean, you, you get one injury and uh, that's it. You can't work out the way you were doing before. Not only can you not work out the way you were doing before, but you're reminded every second, every time you try to move, mm-hmm. that something hurts. Well, I think it's important that we we distinguish the difference mm-hmm. between uh, injury type pain and chronic pain, because and then also uh, a lot of people that don't think they have chronic pain just and they attribute it to being older, right? Those three things I think of, right? I have either one, yeah. somebody doesn't understand the difference of like uh, acute pain from an injury. Uh, to what is chronic pain, and then what is oh, well, this is just how I feel because I'm older. Because mm-hmm, totally. that was one of the things when I when I I never forget uh, training clients, and I would get somebody. You know, remember I started when I was 20, right? So I was just just a pup. And you get somebody in your office who's 45, 55 years old, like seems ancient to you when you're 20 years old, and, and they think you're a, a child at that mm-hmm. point. And I'm assessing them to mm-hmm. tell them what's wrong with their body. And they would just look back at me and be like, son, you don't understand. When yeah, you, you don't understand. When you, when you get my age, you'll feel it. This is, it just, ha- everybody gets this way. Everybody feels this way. And I remember being so frustrated as a kid, because I remember going through all of our, the schooling and education to learn about all this and understand that like, no, this is, that's not why these people feel this way. They, I, I can help them. I want to help them. But they, mm. they would, they would attribute the these, you know, this chronic pain, the 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 sore, the low low back that bothered them late after a long day of work. The the knees crackling and aching on some days. The ankles being stiff or the the neck being frozen and locked up and causing headaches. That was just that wasn't chronic pain to them. That was just uh, this is part of getting old. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a big difference between um, acute and chronic pain and injury because we need to, and we do, we need to de- decipher the two. So if your knee hurts because you you fell on it or you twisted it and it's torn, that is acute injury type pain. Chronic pain is the kind of pain that just is with you all the time. Yeah. It's like, you know, oh, my knee hurts. When did you hurt your knee? Oh, 15 years ago. And it's funny. You almost get removed from it because you've been living with it for so long. And these are a lot of clients, to to Adam's point, like on the other end of that, where they just don't even bring it up because it's just something that they've been living with so long that they don't even recognize it as a problem anymore. Yeah. And and chronic pain is treated very differently than acute pain. If you tore something or broke something, you rest it and let it heal. That's how you deal with uh, acute pain. Chronic pain... If you leave it alone and rest it and let it do nothing, it oftentimes gets worse. If you're low back, if you have low back pain, that's not due to an actual injury that just happened. It's just my back hurts. Just it always hurts if I if I if I walk too long or I stand too long, my low back hurts. The 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 way you solve that is not by okay not standing and not moving anymore. Temporarily, you might not hurt anymore, but things are going to get weaker. And that chron- what caused that chronic pain? Is going to get continue to get worse. So the way you deal with chronic pain is very, very different. And chronic pain is a big, big problem. One out of five. This is an actual statistic. One out of five Americans report suffering from chronic pain. Now I said report because the number's higher than that. Because to Justin's point, uh, I can't tell you how many. This is actually more often than not. That's how often this would happen. A client would sit in front of me and I'd say, "Do you have any areas of chronic pain?" And they'd be like, "No, I don't." And then I'd say, okay. Yeah. And I knew I knew better because I'd been training people for a long time. So I'd be like, okay. Um, and I'd go down the list. How's your neck? How's your shoulder? How's your wrist? How's your and before you know it, I'd be like, oh my shoulder, yeah, it kind of bothers me, but that's you know, that's just just hurts if yeah. I don't move it this or way. Stiff or it's yeah. stiff. Yeah. Oh, my low back, yeah, yeah, it gets really tight, but if I as long as I don't bend I over. Can't raise my arm, but it's yeah. not a big yeah. deal. <laughs> or you do an exercise and they just told you everything's perfectly fine, and you do one lunge, like, oh, I can't do that, my knee hurts. Right. So so I think there's more people suffering from chronic pain than actually report it. Um, and it's just we just accept it, and we we actually change how we walk, how we move, how we sit to try to get around from that. And even worse than that, twenty million people report suffering from pain that literally interferes with daily life. That's how many people mm. in this country have the kind of chronic pain that they actually say, "Listen, this is making life suck. This is making life uh, very very difficult." Well, to their defense, a lot of a lot of the problem is. They think that okay, if my low back hurts uh, and it, or it feels that way from a long day of work or whatever, but they know they didn't do anything to directly injure it. They don't connect that to to chronic pain, right? Mm-hmm. So that th- part of the problem is is understanding that no, the body you can be 
believe it or not, you can be 80 years old and not have your low back feel terrible all day or your shoulder feel f- locked up all the time. Mm-hmm. It's what it is is they, they they don't realize it because they didn't do like a specific injury. And and listen, I'm coming also from a place where I I understand because this is even was even me, okay? And what they do is they avoid things in the gym that they think aggravate it or make it worse when there's they're not addressing the root cause. So mm. Using myself as an example, and I, mine started to creep in like in my late twenties, early thirties when I really started nose. And I would get low back pain. I had low chronic back pain, and the my if I was on my feet all day long, or maybe if I played basketball, or if I lifted squats, I would my back would just be on fire. And because I know I didn't do any like a specific injury to my back, like my logic to that was like, oh, it's you know, it's just bother me because I'm not very good at squatting or whatever. And I just kind of put it to the side. And then and then what ends up happening is you kind of put it to the side and then it starts to creep up more and more and more until it becomes debilitating, until people literally affects their their daily life. And then when they decide that they they want to try and do something about it, they think it's the the back is the problem because my low back is bothering me. But it's really not my low back. It's all the things that are surrounding it that are stressing the low back. And most commonly, when we talk about low back, in in, in my experience, it's been the whole hip complex that is really locked up and tight because of the inability of your hips. And then that's pulling and straining on the low back. To take it a step Mm -hmm. further, it's not even, oh, it's my low back that's bad. It's the, oh, it's because I walked a lot. Right. Because I stood a lot. Like I'll talk Mm -hmm. to people and they'll Mm -hmm. say, oh, you know, no, I don't have, my knee doesn't, I don't have chronic pain with my knee. Um, but I, if I walk longer than 30 minutes, it starts to hurt. So I just don't walk for longer than 30 minutes, yeah. you know, or, oh yeah, my, yeah, my back hurts, but that's because I was standing for three hours. That's why my back hurts. You're not supposed to be in pain when you do regular things. Now I understand if you go and test the limits of your, of your physical capacity, you might have some soreness, but if you're like, you know, if you go to the mall and you're going shopping for four hours and you come home with back pain. That's not because you were shopping for four hours. That's because you have some issues with the way your body moves. What you need to understand is that your body is all connected. And if one thing isn't moving optimally, because your body, by the way, your body doesn't understand, you know, joint by joint, muscle by muscle. It just understands function. So if I get up to walk, my body's not thinking hip flexor, quad, hamstring, calf, soleus, tense up the core. It doesn't work that way. Be a very that would be such an inefficient process. What it thinks is propel the body forward. So let's say I have a bad ankle. Let's say my left ankle is bad. What will automatically happen without me thinking is I'll limp. Mm-hmm. I'll change my walking behavior. I'll change that movement pattern automatically. And this is a wonderful thing that your body does. It it moves in spite of the fact that you have bad mobility issues or bad connection issues. It moves in spite of all of those things. So you can still move. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we think, oh, it's the movement that's causing the problem. No, no, no. It's because you can't move optimally. Yeah. And then a lot of times like these little compensations that happen, it, it goes up the kinetic chain. So all the rest of your limbs and, you know, places where you, you'd never think it would affect, like it might affect your neck, uh, you know, you have an ankle injury, That's- things like that. So it's just, you know, th- these creep up on you and, and it's, and it's, it's going to be to your benefit to really like do your homework and come back and really try to trace back to the root of all of this movement. Dude, I, I did an experiment with a trainer that worked for me years ago. We had this whole conversation and we put a half an inch rise in her left shoe. Okay. So one foot was a half an inch taller than the other foot. And I said, walk around in this all day long and let me know where you start to feel the pain. And you know, first it was the hip, then it was the low back, mm-hmm. then it was her shoulder and neck. It's all connected. Yeah. All because one foot was a little bit higher than the other one. So you're exactly right, Justin. And now why is this important to know? Because you may have pain in one area, but it's not necessarily because your knee might not hurt. But it, probably, it may hurt because you have a bad knee, but more often than not, if it's not an injury, it's not because you have a bad knee. It's because your ankles or your hips or something else isn't moving properly. So now your knee has to take over and do more than it should. That's another really good point to bring up is and it's very common that you had somebody who like maybe broke an ankle or t- torn uh, you know ligament in their knee on one side 
And then, you know, years they recover from it. You know, they were young when it happened and now they're in their, you know, later advanced age and now they feel neck or low back and, and they don't think it has anything to do with the knee. But this is, this goes back to this, the conversation that we had the other day about the importance of rehabbing correctly. A lot of times what has happened to us is, is most people has had, have had somewhat of an injury like that, whether it be a, a major sprain or a break or a tear somewhere on their body. And they rehabbed, recovered at one point, but they never recovered back to where their body was moving and speaking, you know, synergistically to each other. Right, where right, it was right. even on, on each side. What ends up happening is to your point you made, Sal, that the body just understands function. So if you got, if I tore my, my, my left knee, right, my ligaments in my left knee, and I had, you know, the brace on and cast on for six months, I rehab, and I didn't do a really good job, you know, post uh, surgery of balancing my left and right side out, I just got better at compensating because of the injury at using my other side. That kind of stays with you even when you get out of rehab. And that's a lot of people don't connect that. And it doesn't come creeping until maybe years or even sometimes mm -hmm. decades later. And, it, and then it reveals itself, like Justin said, you know, neck or shoulder pain. But really, it was that broken ankle on, on your right side, you know, a decade ago that you never rehabbed completely right. and fit, balanced your and body it's out. It's tricky because you feel that uh, that immediate relief because the, the acute pain has gone away. Right. And, and you've become more efficient at walking again and doing daily functions and everything. But these compensations, these patterns of favoring a side have really added up over the years. And that, that, creeps up to, to the point where it becomes its own problem. And so this is something that people just need to realize that that could definitely happen. And, and here's what ends up happening. You you develop movement patterns that are suboptimal. Suboptimal patterns put more wear and tear on your joints. They tighten some muscles up because you're not moving the best way possible. So some muscles have to overcompensate to correct for that. And so you start to get pain and you start to get problems. Some muscles actually turn off. Okay, so mm -hmm. if you never, if you never reach over your head, so like right now, if you you're listening to the podcast, like I'm going to put this to the test, I'm not going to reach up above my head for the next two years, you'll lose that ability. Those muscles actually, in that range of motion, starts to turn off. So what does mobility aim to do? Mobility aims to get you to learn new patterns and turn muscles on in ways to support that. That's what mobility uh, aims to do, and this is why. Working on this is the most important possible thing you can do, regardless of what your goals are. Because let's say your goal is to build maximal muscle. Like, I just want to build a lot of muscle. I really don't care about this kind of stuff. Well, here's why it's important. If you want to build maximal muscle, you need to be able to lift heavy, you need to be able to train intensely, and you need to be able to do this consistently. Well, if you're moving suboptimally, that's a recipe for disaster. Not only that, but let's say you never hurt yourself. You will never reach your full potential because when your body moves optimally, that's when you build the most muscle and lift the most weight. When it moves suboptimally, you never reach that upper limit of your potential. So this is a very important thing to pay attention to. And more importantly, this is something that you pay attention to always. You never take your eye off of it. This was a, a paradigm shattering moment for me as a young lifter. Um, so as an athlete, uh, a left-handed athlete, I was uh, very dominant uh, on my left side. I shoot, throw, do everything left-handed. And so, and this is before I know this, right? So I haven't made this connection yet. Uh, and I get into lifting weights not long after when I'm playing sports. And I'm, now I'm really like the, the skinny guy trying to build muscle. I care, I care less about sports. Now I just want to build, build a physique. And I remember like being so frustrated with my chest development. I had a really weak chest. It was like almost concave. And when I started like really, you know, lifting a lot and consistent, I started to kind of develop a little bit of a chest, but what really was discouraging was it was uneven. Like one side, I had my right pec was like way more developed than my left pec, which, you know, for a young kid at this point, I, I, can't, I wasn't making the connection. I'm like, this makes sense. My left side is my stronger side. Why is it less developed than my right side? Mm. And the reason why that is, and this was this this was that paradigm shattering moment for me when I started to learn all this and the importance of pro posture and mechanics and mm -hmm. fixing anything any imbalances that I had, because I played sports for so long on the left side, I had this kind of I had more of a, a rotated forward shoulder 
on the left side. Now, we know when you get in to do a bench tre- bench press or a chest fly, you want to get yourself in that retracted position to engage the chest. If your shoulders are rolled forward and you go to do a bench press, a fly, or a chest exercise, the shoulders take over the movement. So what was happening when I'm doing these barbell exercises and machine exercises is that my, that shoulder on the left side was, ch- and I'm talking, you can't. it's not glaring and obvious. This is why this is so important to really assess this is it was just slightly rolled forward a little bit more than my right side. And then I'm just, you know, body's just going to just get the bar up. That's all it's thinking. So I'm just bench pressing away and the young mm-hmm. kid, all I'm caring about, am I stronger? Am I stronger? Putting more weight on. And what ends up happening is I get this kind of developed shoulder on that left side. Chest is never really getting activated very well in all my chest exercises on the left side, but the right side is. And so now my body looks off. And it took years of correcting that after I overdid it the other way. And this is the important part and why I I stress this type of stuff to every single client, why under assessing posture and addressing that first is so important because even if you're not dealing, even if you're a 23-year-old kid right now listening and you don't have, you're not battling bad chronic pain, but you don't have really good posture, which is also changing how good your mechanics are when you when you do the movements, you end up overdeveloping one side or the other. And then it creates this kind of imbalance. And look, and now I have a bigger problem to go back and reverse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you were to compare, if you had twins and one twin had good movement, good control, stability, mobility, and the other one had bad control, good, bad movement, all that stuff. But they looked to start off working out identical, and then they both start working out. Here's how the difference uh, in, in terms of the development will start to play out. The person with the poor mobility and poor connection is going to develop uh, imbalances in their muscles. They're going to develop a physique that doesn't look as pleasing. It doesn't look as balanced. They, they don't have as much symmetry. It doesn't develop as well. They also won't build muscle as fast because they're – they're pressing the, the, the limits of the, the, the hinges without the good mobility. Now, the person who can move now well progresses faster because they can maximize the effectiveness of each exercise. They're balanced in terms of their development. They look more aesthetic. And then the obvious, the person who has poor mobility, probably going to get hurt, which will slow them down even more, mm-hmm. while the other person probably won't get hurt. It makes that big of a difference. And again, this is something you have to or you should pay attention to Always, if your goal is to have maximum results consistently, this is number one. There is it's nothing at above the it. the utmost importance, especially in the athletic realm. I'm always stressing that, you know, like assessing movement. Assessing movement with the athletes, that's first and foremost. Are your joints able to do what they're supposed to do? Are you set in the proper ways where, you, you know, you're allowed to dis- – you're you're able to distribute force correctly through your body. There's a, there's if you think of a house, a house has you know a structural foundation, a way that everything is aligned so that it can withstand the amount of force that's coming down. And when that's just a little bit off, you know it may not be immediately, but over time it's gonna it's gonna really affect the the foundation, the the way that the house is is standing up still. You know, so that that's something that we have this this preset way to move uh, with our joints that's going to be able to distribute uh, this force and withstand force uh, at its most optimal points. Well, that, that your analogy with the house is exactly what I used to use with clients who would come to me so focused on you know the way they looked or their, the scale weight. Like, oh, Adam, I just want to lose 30 pounds. I don't care about anything else. Just get me there. I just want to build this. And when I hear that, the analogy I'd give them is like, you know, that's you're coming to a contractor, okay? I'm the construction worker now. I'm not your personal trainer. And you want me to build, build you this beautiful house that you have this vision of, and you want me to skip laying the foundation. You want a Hollywood shell house is what you want. Yeah. You ever yeah. go to those, you ever go to those yeah. sets where they have like the fake house or whatever? Yeah. Right? That's what they want. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? Right and here's the reality of it. That's possible. You know, I could throw up, I could frame up some walls and throw a roof on it and everything like that, but it's not going to last forever. Mm-hmm. You know, it definitely is not. It looks and, nice, uh, like initially. Yeah, right. if if you look at it from far away, right, <laughs> yeah, it does. right. And so that's why I love that analogy when you're talking about getting somebody to move optimally and teach them about posture and and be able to. Break, you know, here's another one. Like so, very and and I know I, I'm, I'm going to try and give as many as I can as we're going through this because. I know this will make connection with the younger crowd. It's very easy to talk about chronic pain to someone who's 55, 
Like there's, yeah. you, it's not. It's very easy. But yeah. trying to get this point across to somebody who's 23 right now and the importance of it, that's fucking hard. And I know how that because it was been hard for me. Now, somebody who's uh, can relate to this bicep curling. And this is why I did this YouTube video that's controversial that like is done really well on our YouTube channel that I got a lot of trolls that, that hated me for this. But I teach this bicep curl and I make clients do a split stance and put their weight on, on the front foot and pull their shoulder blades back. And I do this little balance thing. And I get, of course, I got hammered for, for, for teaching this. But I'll tell you why I teach this. Because a lot of people are just, just slightly off enough on their mechanics of bicep curling and one, one, one shoulder's a little more forward, and so the anterior delt takes over a little bit more on the left side than it does the right side, which is just enough of over years of bicep curling, two or three years, to have one side more developed than the other, mm. or one dramatically stronger than the other. You can curl 35-pound dumbbell with the left arm, but the right one you can only do 25. It, it's probably and, and then what do they their answer is just curl more with the opposite side no that's not there was there's a breakdown mechanically somewhere and I'll tell you the most common area that I have found when doing bicep curls is exactly what I said it's because all of us tend to be right or left side dominant because we we write with our right hand or we brush our teeth comb our hair we do a lot with one side more than the other and guess what that over time will cause this in, this imbalance. And so then when you go to do these these movements and these these exercises, if you're not conscious of that, your body is always going to take the easiest path. And so if that means it cheats up with the shoulder a little bit more on that, you know, more dominant or forward side, then what ends up happening is you get an imbalance in the bicep. And then you think it has something to do with, oh, I just need to do more on the other side. Like, no, there's there's a root cause for that. And the, the earlier you become, okay, the young kids that are listening right now, the earlier you become aware of this, and are, and become conscious of your training. When you do that, the the less the less work you'll have going down the road, and the more results you'll get if you lay that foundation. Oh, way better results. I I, used to, I remember when I would train some clients who couldn't get full extension of their arms up above their head. That's actually a tough one for a lot of people. A lot of people think they can get really good full extension, but in reality, what they're doing is they're arching their back and doing all kinds of weird stuff. And I'd have them do a shoulder press, and I'd tell them to push the dumbbells up a little higher, push them up a little higher. You know what they do? They come up. They come, their toes. Heels. they come up on their toes. Yeah. And it, it, the reason why they come up on their toes is because their mind, again, your body says, move the dumbbells higher. Arms can't do it. I'm coming up on the toes. It's automatic. Yep. This is automatic. This is why you train movements. This is not why I'm going. This is why mobility is not treated like this. Oh, I have a weak, you know, glute. Just work out my glute. No, no, no. Work the movement. Your body doesn't understand that way. Now I know bodybuilding is around developing individual body parts. Nothing wrong with that. But proper mobility is about training movements and connection because your body doesn't understand muscle groups. It only understands movement. So, all right, what's the first step? First step in getting somebody to work on chronic pain. Obviously, it's got to be identify the root. Mm -hmm. What is the root cause of this pain? Now, it is important to note that there are certain joints of the body that oftentimes are not the problem. And what I mean by that is if you have low back pain, knee pain, elbow pain, neck pain, sometimes, many times, it's not because you have a bad problem with your knee, low back, elbow, or neck. Oftentimes, it's because of the surrounding joints. Oftentimes, it's because those joints or areas are overcompensating. The low back is a, is a very, very common one. You can definitely have low back pain because you actually have issues with your low back, slip disc or pinch nerve and that kind of stuff. Yeah, but even those things, right, over time is caused because of a, a dysfunction in the hip complex. Right? Hip, yep. You've got an anterior pelvic tilt or you have lack of mobility in the <laughs> hips and the years and years of that being compressed is now compressed the disc and now you have this. And you know what's funny? It's that when you, I would, uh, again, I, tra I train lots of surgeons, uh, you know, as a trainer and many of them would tell me, you know, Sal, if you took 10 people off the streets and you image their low back, you would see... Lots of people who have discs that are out here and there, and very few of them would have any symptoms. They don't even realize it. And he goes, and, some, and he goes, many times we have people coming in with severe low back, and we see nothing hmm. on the images. We can't find any problems whatsoever. And they, a lot of people, most of the clients I ever had would come into me brand new with some kind of chronic low back pain, and nine out of ten times we could alleviate it tremendously by getting better with their hip mobility getting better with their core stability. Those two things right there, yeah. oh boy, that that used to handle so many people's 
uh, low back pain. Well, and and I, we have to dress knee like that too. Like you you name the four big ones in in my opinion too. Like how we get lots of people. Like one of the most common areas to foam roll is your IT. Uh, even if you're you're relatively new to health and fitness, you've probably seen a foam roller, mm -hmm. and the probably the most common area that people have to foam roll is the IT, right? The side of your- It hurts the most right away. Right, right. You, it's, you feel either either one, you're somebody who feels the pain in the front of your kneecap, and that's related to the IT, or you feel that in the hip, and the, it feels like a sharp pain is, is or a knife is being stuck in the side of your hip. Now, the reality of that is the foam roller is not fixing the problem. It's giving you temporary relief, and so, oh my God, right after you do it, it's like it feels better, but it's the movement patterns that's causing it to keep getting tight again. Yeah. And if you just foam roll it, you're going to be right back in that situation every single time you come back to work out again, unless you start to address movement. And because of it, the no most common, okay, even though there's always exceptions to the rule, but the most common thing that I've seen is related down into the foot ankle area or all the way up into the hip area. Either one, their their feet are are pronating really bad and they have limited ankle mobility and control. And so the the femur is internally rotating, which is like twisting the IT band, like like wringing it out and twisting it, which is causing it to get really tight and knotted up and gives you that pulling sensation. Or it's the inability to control the hip through its full range of motion and just oh, the muscles in that whole hip complex are are being pulled and tightened because they're they're overworking because the hip's not mm -hmm. moving properly. And then that all leads to this knee pain problem. And it's not you have bad knees. I mean, how many times have you heard that? Oh, I can't do this because I have bad knees. Like, no, you don't have bad knees. It's everything that's around it that we're not taking care of. And so your knees are bothering you. And so learning how to assess that. And this really was, I remember, to me, you know, we talk a lot about the programs that we've created and the ones that like have made us most proud. And for sure, Prime and Prime Pro for me uh, are those programs because it just took a lot. It took a lot of thinking for us. Like, okay, now how do we take all of the collection of, of experience that the three of us have of all the different types of bodies and issues and pain and stuff that people dealt with? Now, how do we how do we simplify this so we can help the average person that's suffering from this, but then not oversimplify it that we're we're not doing much good whatsoever? And yeah. that was where we had this idea of like, okay, what we're gonna do is. We're just going to have a pass or fail type of test for every joint, the major joints, right? So we take you through seven of the major joints in the body that are most commonly causing dysfunction or aches and pains in the body. There's a test that's in it, and you do the test. Mm -hmm. And you, I, and we made it cut and dry. Like we, we, I remember we went back. I remember arguing back and forth. Oh, should we do? You score a seven or yeah. a ten? We're like, no. You know what? Here's the deal. We're just going to make it very simple for people. They either can pass it with flying colors. They got great mobility, or there's work to do, or there's work to do. Mm -hmm. And if it's so, if you if you have if you struggle with it, add in the slightest bit. There's always work to do. It's just a matter of how much work it needs to be done. If you can barely move it or do anything, there's a lot of work to be done. So it's mm -hmm. pass or fail. If you fail that joint area, oh, it looks like I I have bad ankle mobility. Then it points you in the direction of mobility movements that are specific to that joint to help that. And then the recommendation, obviously in the blueprints, we tell everybody what to do, but then the recommendation that I normally give aside from our blueprints is, listen, this is gonna seem overwhelming because a lot of people are gonna feel so broken the first time they do this because they're gonna fail so many tests. So the idea is you pick a couple of these that are making the, the, the that are giving you the most relief or making the most change. If you, if you have low back pain, you have bad knees, you got neck, all, all the issues, Pick a couple of the movements that are really going to alleviate that and practice them as much as you can. And we get a lot of questions about like the difference between the two programs. I think for me, uh, it's more, if you look at prime is more of a broad stroke. So now if, if it's not so obvious, like it's my ankle, that's the problem. And like you go through the assessment and the seven different joints and you're going through that process, you know, in prime pro, but really you're just going through our three movements that we've, we've identified as, uh, you know, our upper extremities, our torso, and then our lower extremities. And then how they all function and how they all do what they're supposed to do in movement and space and seeing that, oh my God, I can't, I can't reach my arm back as far as I could and I can't touch my elbow back. What does that mean? And why am I restricted and all that? So we had to try to try to make it because like we initially brought up in the beginning of this episode, a lot of people like they just don't realize that these restrictions are going to become a problem. And so uh, to be able to identify that and find the root of, uh, you know, your movement issues 
is going to be very beneficial for you to then bring back into working out. Well, there's a natural uh, range of motion that your joints are supposed to have. There really is. And there's a, and what I mean by supposed to have is not just that, that, you know, it's not like I could just take Justin's arm and move it through this range of motion. That's part of it. But really what it is, is he should be able to do it himself. Control. Yep. He should not just be able to do it himself. It should feel strong and stable the entire way. Now think about it this way. Is there a position you can bend your body where it feels like if I just poke you or push you a little bit, it's going to tear a muscle or hurt you? That means you don't have control mm -hmm. or strength in that particular range of motion. Okay, You want to have control and stability in all of the range of motions that your joints provide. That's what true mobility gives you. Now, why should you prioritize that? Like, Why should you prioritize that over the goals of fat loss and building muscle? Well, I'll tell you. If you want to burn body fat in the most effective way possible, or you want to build muscle in the most effective way possible, you probably are going to exercise, okay? You're going to work out. You're going to use movements to get the body to adapt and respond. Now, in order to utilize these movements effectively and to reap the potential benefits that these movements can provide you, you have to have good movement. Good movement is what makes a squat so damn effective. Bad movement is also what makes a squat so damn dangerous, or any exercise for that matter. Any exercise has the potential to be, have a certain level of effectiveness, and any exercise has the potential to be, have a certain level of risk of injury. Your ability to move is what determines that. So if you want to go into the gym or your garage or into your workout, and you want to have a arsenal. You want to have a full category of movements. And not only that, but you want to be able to reap the benefits of all of those exercises on your body. You have to be able to move well. If you can't move well, your arsenal shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. If your lower back prevents you from doing barbell squats, you can never reap the benefits of one of the best exercises uh, for the lower body. If your shoulders prevent you from doing an overhead press because they hurt, well, now you can never reap the benefits of that phenomenal exercise. So that's why prioritizing movement is the most important thing because if you want to walk into your goals with all the tools you possibly have that you can have at your, at your disposal, with all of the potential of what those things can provide you, you have to be able to move well. And what you don't want to do is this. This is a big mistake a lot of people make. They train for fat loss. They train for muscle building. And they never work on movement. And as they get older, more and more exercises get taken out of their arsenal. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I used to be able to squat in my twenties. Now I can't. Now I just leg press. Oh, I can't even leg press anymore. Now it's just leg extensions. And before you know it, I can't even work out my legs anymore. Mm -hmm. But by the way, this is very common. So it's not just about what hurts me right now. It's about do I want to be able to do these amazing exercises? And by the way, being able to do these amazing exercises, do you know what that means you're going to feel like when you're not working out? Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that means you're going to move around. You're going to feel good. You're going to move. You're you still feel have loose. all those abilities that you have right now. Absolutely. Well, talking about fat loss and muscle building, we touched on this a little bit the other day when we talked about isometrics. And there's that point, too, to be made that, you know, the better that you can move, the more muscle fibers you can recruit to aid that movement and that exercise, to totally. which then results in more muscle and burning more body fat. Performance so, enhancement. Right. So the, 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 the ability for you to connect, and I did this in the webinar, right? So uh, I, mean, I think Sal was teasing me, right? I love when Adam talks science-y. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is, this is just, I, I, I've, uh, a part of what the success I've had as a personal trainer, for sure, has been able to, to take really complex things like this and really simplify it for the average person. And it pisses academia off all the time because I don't say it exactly how they want to or you know exaggerate, <laughs> exaggerate something to make a point across. And I don't give a shit because my point is to help the average person really get grasp the concept of something that is extremely complex, right? right. And nuanced. And what we're talking about can be very complex and nuanced, but a simple way that I explain to people, like when we, when we try to do one of these mobility exercises and you can't perform it right at, to a certain extent, or you have limited range of motion, it's not just a, a muscle thing that's going on there. It starts on a neurological level. And Sal alluded to this earlier that the body is just going to take the easiest path. It's just going to, it's just designed to do function. If you stop doing something, it would not be advantageous for the brain to send neurons over to those muscles you're not using. 
it says, okay, he's not using it. So let's pretend in a perfect world you, you can use everything, right? You're super limber. You're super strong everywhere. The brain fires neurons to all these different muscles to activate and move around. Well, as you get older and you stop using them, you lose that. You and, and it starts at the neurological level. It says, okay, we used to use, you know, let's just say for the, this this argument's sake, right? I used to use one million neurons to get the hand to be able to lift above the head. I no longer do that anymore. I haven't done that for 10 years. So now the body says, well, that's inefficient for me to send a bunch of neurons over to those muscles that aren't being used. Let's send them to other places of the body that we are using because it's more efficient to do that. And so there's that's the connection that you lose. Well, you, you think people you think that what adapts as you work out are your muscles, which is true. But what Adam's saying is it's your it's your brain, it's your central nervous system that adapts right along with it. And just like your muscles can adapt in the opposite direction, where if I don't work out, my body will actually shrink my muscles. It'll adapt in the opposite direction because it doesn't need to have this extra energy going to something that it's not using. Your body will actually do that with your brain and your central nervous system as well. It'll adapt in the opposite direction. Your body only is ever as good as it needs to be. It's never going to be any better. You ever see those videos of like, there's the videos of kids who, who maybe they grew up and they didn't have any arms, so they do everything with their feet. Mm -hmm. You ever seen the articulation of their oh, toes? Oh, yeah, the dexterity yeah. that they have, oh, the they, control, it's unreal. Oh, they can handle fork and spoon and they brush their teeth. They can cereal with their toes. <laughs> all kinds of stuff mm. with their toes. And you, you think to yourself, well, that's crazy. Well, you are capable of that too. They just practiced and practiced, and their brain and their central nervous system developed all the connections to be able to do that. Now, if they stopped doing that, they would lose that ability as well. So a lot of the reasons why we have these mobility issues is we lose these connections. And a lot of the ways that you train in mobility is to regain these con connections. You know, I, I remember when the, the one of the first times we went to see Dr. Brink. Dr. Brink is a movement specialist that actually uh, helped us with MAPS Prime Pro because MAPS Prime Pro goes much more in depth uh, with correctional exercise. And we wanted to enlist uh, the help of somebody who we thought we, you know, we really respected. And I remember we went to go see him and we did, and he, he was walking us through the 90-90 position, which if you don't know what that is, you can go on our YouTube channel. We have videos on on 90-90. I do this, ana the analogy you're about to explain, I do this in the webinar oh, too. Oh, and by the way, there's yeah, there, there's a webinar you can go and, and watch actually uh, where Adam takes you through five of his favorite uh, mobility movements. And Adam actually, he's, he's an exceptional uh, teacher because he's got phenomenal cues. So I suggest everybody go check that out. That's uh, mindpumpwebinar.com. Uh, but I went to go see Dr. Brink and he you know, puts me in 9090 and he says, okay, now I want you, without lifting your back knee up, I want you to take your foot off the floor. And I looked at him like, you're crazy. Like, I, that doesn't even exist. Like, it, it would be like asking me to fly. Like that movement, that connection doesn't exist. I can't, yeah. just, I can't just do it. And he says, you have the range of motion. And I said, no, I don't. And he goes, yeah, you do. And he takes my foot. He just picks and he, it up. Picks it up, rotates my my back leg, my knee still on the floor, and brings it up next to yeah. my head. Yeah, you can touch like the back of your head with it. And you know, it's weird. I looked back, and it felt like a dummy foot. It yeah. was like somebody grabbed a, a, someone else's foot and put him. It didn't even feel yeah. like it was like you mine. Just sawed your leg off. It did not feel like it was mine. Yeah. It was a very strange feeling. The reason why it felt so weird is because I had zero connection to that movement. I had. No central nervous system connection. Now, the muscles exist that could do it. I still have them on my body. So the muscles can do it, but there's no signal. Mm -hmm. There's no instructions coming from my brain. So how do I gain that? How do I gain that connection? Through practice, through mobility, through trying to connect to those ranges of motion. And what ends up happening is little by little by little, I start to be able to control that weird range of motion that I thought felt so strange. And to, and to that point, that brings me to the next thing that's important is the, is the, the frequency of it is because, and, and I love you. I'm glad you went that way because it transitions perfect into what I want to explain is that you take something like that, who somebody who can't, because I was in the same boat as Sal. I couldn't even get my leg to move. Like I remember we were all together yeah, and, so weird. and Brink said to do <laughs> this. And I was just like, yeah, not happening. Like it just, there's, there's, it's cool not even story. It's not even not happening. Like I don't even feel, you don't even know how to make yeah, it. Happen. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It just it feels so foreign to me, but here's the thing. Like, and what he would do is he would, he would lift it a little bit off the ground and then, you know, try and get you to hold it there. And then it was like, like hovering by an inch and uh, I'd fight. And then I'd start to kind of feel something, but it, it just, it took, practice of doing that every day, three, four times a day. And then before you knew it, it went from, I couldn't move it to now I could kind of move it and activate it. Then it was like, I could lift it an inch and then two inches and then three. And then before you knew it, I could lift that thing off by a foot 
off the ground, something that I had no control whatsoever. But it was the the um, the amount of frequency that I was doing it. It wasn't like I did two mobility sessions or saw Brink three or four times, and then all of a sudden I've got this great control of my hips. Like no, I had to really like learning a language again. I had to practice and practice and practice and practice and get this connection going before I could really start to improve on it. But holy shit, once I did, it was a, a, a game changer for me on the relief that I got. Yeah. So it. so to to put it plainly, um, rather than doing uh, one hour mobility workout twice a week, which that'll bring you value, okay? I'm not going to lie. That'll still bring you lots of value. You're better off doing, you know, four 30-minute sessions in the week or even better, eight 15-minute sessions during the yeah, week. Same that, total time, yeah. just practice, practice, practice. I've had probably the best uh, response from clients that have, that have taken it into chunks like that where they do 10 minutes, they do 15 minutes, and it's very specific to their – their individual issues. And that's why the assessment part is so vital to then uh, being able to create this sort of ritual that you you just plan it out to do whenever you're brushing your teeth or you know you're you're watching mm. TV or you're just you're just uh, doing your regular everyday activities, but now you just you just put that in there as a new thing. Right. So let me break it down, right? So here's what you're looking to do. First off, strength is a function of both muscle and the central nervous system. The central nervous system sends the signal. If the signal is loud, you're going to be stronger than if it's weak. And of course, you're going to be stronger than if it's non-existent. The muscle itself is what performs the movement. And the bigger it is, the stronger it is. Okay, so when we're doing mobility, step one is just to get a connection. That's all we're trying to do. I'm trying to get... I can't even focus on building... The muscle isn't going to build because there's no connection whatsoever. So step one is getting a connection. The best way to get a connection is to practice a lot frequently. Not hard, not long. In fact, if you sit there and practice for three hours, you're going to get worse and worse at it. Practice it frequently. 15 minutes every single day is better than, like I said, an hour twice a week. Even if you add up the same amount of time, it's that frequency that because you're going to get more. You're always practicing getting connected. Then as you get connected, you practice on developing a solid connection. Then when you have a really solid connection, okay, fine. You have Now you have a solid connection to internal hip rotation that you didn't have before. All right, you want to build really big internal rotators on your hips? Now you could train it more traditionally where you train with resistance and that kind of stuff. But that's different. Now you go do your squats and your deadlifts and stuff like that. But if you want to improve mobility, you got to work on connection and frequency is king. So that's the way you treat this type of training. It's not like your normal training. You're not doing this for an hour at a time. Now, the mobility webinar that Adam does, he takes you through full a full hour because he's teaching you how to do all these things. But what you should do is take movements specific to your body, practice them every single day. And now this is where MAPS Prime came in. The mm -hmm. priming concept is at the bare minimum, what you should do is at least prime the areas that you have deficiencies in before you go into lift weights and potentially make that worse. So for example, if you're somebody who is rounded shoulders and forward head, and I love to pick this one because I know fucking everybody listening, this is you, all of us are. And it's just you're how- listening to this podcast like that yeah. right now. Yes, <laughs> right? So, over. so at the bare minimum, you before, okay, if you're not going to spend an hour long session or doing it three times a day for 15 minutes, the bare minimum before you go lift weights and potentially make- a, a postural deviation worse, you prime yourself to at least get you into a more optimal position. So let's use the rounded shoulders. So I'm going to go over and do like band pull-aparts or seated row type movements. And what I'm doing is I'm waking up mm -hmm. all those muscles in my upper back that are responsible for pulling my shoulder girdle back, which is where I want to be before I go do an overhead press, before I do a bench press, before I do any of these pushing movements in front of my body that could exact make the patterns worse if I don't address, at the bare minimum, I want to prime that. Now, in a perfect world, you do those things, and then in addition, you have these little mobility moves that you're sprinkling throughout your day and workout all the time, and then you can progress 
over time. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it is really cementing your optimal posture. So before you get to loading all the joints, you want to make sure that you are a nice rigid structure. Everything is stacked properly. And then you go in to do your major lifts and there's a hundred percent less likelihood that, you know, something bad's going to happen or, uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to perform a lot better too, having everything aligned uh, properly. Yeah. It's like when, when you would train a client and you'd have them do a cable row and you'd say, pull your shoulders back and they'd be like, I am. And you're like, no, you're not. And then all you would do sometimes is you touch the mid back and you let them have that feedback. They'd feel it. And then, oh, there it is. Now I can get the good form. What priming is doing, Adam uses the term waking up. I'm sure there's some, you know, some, some academics are like, oh, the oh, muscles aren't waking up. I know. Up. They, hate, they hate okay. that one. Uh, what's happening is you're, you know what it's supposed to feel like. That's what priming does. You know now, because I'm doing these movements and activating, now I know what the position feels like. Now I can go into the exercise with proper positioning. Good priming just destroys what a warm-up uh, typically does. A warm-up just gets you to move and, uh, okay, I feel better, maybe a little more limber or whatever. Priming allows you to perform your exercises much better. And remember, somebody who deadlifts well is going to build more muscle and strength than someone who deadlifts poorly. And what's going to help ensure that you do the deadlift better or the bench press better or whatever lifting you do better? Proper priming. Well, I remember the evolution of this as a trainer too. Like I, before I understood priming and mobility, I understood that we have overactive and underactive muscles and I have tight muscles that I want less tight, right? So that was the beginning as a trainer. So what I would find out, so I remember when I first started doing like assessments and posture and knowing that, okay, a lot of people have these rounded shoulders. Okay. If you have rounded shoulders, the pec, the chest is tight and the, and the shoulder, the front shoulder, your anterior delt is tight, right? That's part of what's causing this rounding forward because you use it so much. It's overactive. It's tight. And so as a young trainer, my way of addressing that was, oh, I have this client that's total round, so I'm going to stretch the chest and stretch the shoulders before I do a workout. That was like very typical of most trainers. That was the the level of understanding of what they needed to do. And it wasn't until later in my career that I understand that I couldn't stop there. I couldn't just stretch and relax the tight muscles if I didn't train the antagonist muscles, the ones on the back side that are responsible for pulling the shoulders back. Otherwise, all I did was kind of relax the shoulder and chest a little bit, and then I go right into an exercise, and I still are going to have poor mechanics. What I really needed to do, and which actually allowed me to completely eliminate the stretching, the the chest and shoulder part, was just focusing on the muscles that I that were dormant, needed to wake up, the pattern yeah, that was Whatever you want to say. Yeah, whatever you <laughs> want to say to, to appease everybody. I needed to get those primed and working and firing, and those would hold me in that position when I go to do an exercise like a bench press. And so I, I then eliminated as a, eliminated these static stretches I was doing with clients like oh you know go against like you go against the bench press and hold right. the hold the chest open stretch for 15 30 seconds go to the other temporary side temporary solution yeah drop the head below the shoulder stretch you know stretch the shoulders out okay now go to bench press like no all I had to do was take that person through band pull aparts and rows and not only did that kind of open the chest and stretch it out naturally because you're doing a, a row but then it also primed all those muscles that I need to be firing and strong and active before I go into a chest. Whatever press. movement you train is the movement you strengthen. And if your movement is bad, you are strengthening bad movements. The bottom line is this, okay? I know mobility isn't uh, as, as sexy as telling you to train your butt or your delts or your chest, but here's the bottom line. If you prioritize it, you will develop muscle faster. In, you indirectly will cause fat burn to happen faster. And from an aesthetic standpoint, a body that moves well is put together better and gives you better aesthetics. So all of you who are interested in just getting better performance and looking better and looking sexier and all that stuff, you still need to make mobility a priority. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides and resources. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. 